I just uh, want to add a little to some of the questions that have been asked. Um, a question was asked on the railway and um, what has been happening, especially with respect to uh, being able to evacuate goods from the port. Uh, two things uh, happening. First, uh, I'm sure that some are already familiar with the concession given to General Electric, to GE, to refurbish the narrow gauge uh, line, which of course starts from the, from the ports itself. And uh, that, is, uh, that, that uh, concession is uh, already uh, in place, and we expect that things should begin to happen very quickly. Also, a uh, private sector, one of the members of that consortium, APM uh, Terminal, is, is going to do something in the Lugu, which is a railway station on the way to Ibadan, and is trying to develop an inland port there. Now, that inland port when developed, and they say that they can do this within 10 weeks. We hope that that will mean that um, uh, further, they, that would just mean a further reduction in the pressure on the Apapa ports. Aside from that, the standard gauge line, which uh, is funded by the China Exim Bank, has already started. And again, that also is taken off from the ports, from the Apapa ports. We expect that by the end of this year, we should see uh, significant improve, uh, progress between the Lagos, the Lagos Ibadan end of that standard gauge line. As a matter of fact, our target is to have that bit of it concluded by the end of this year, and we hope that we can achieve that. So that will move goods also from their papa port out of uh, Lagos to at least as far as Ibadan before uh, we then go on to Kano which is the uh, terminal point of the standard gauge line. The other question which I'd like to add to is the one on the eastern ports. I think somebody asked about the Unisha uh, ports, yes. The concession agreements on that has been finalized. All the technical uh, evaluation has been done. The concession agreement has been finalized now, and that's going uh, to the Attorney General's office. So we expect that that should be sorted out uh, very, very shortly, but that has been concluded. For the, in that same eastern port axis, as a worry port, uh, which uh, is still, the, the technical evaluation is still going on. That hasn't been concluded, but we expect that that should also move on very quickly. So we think that uh, there should be some activity around the eastern ports, you know, especially with the conclusion of the Onitsha port and the uh, worry ports. Uh, the other point, which I think I should just add something to, is uh, the frustration that many of us feel about coming into Nigeria through our airports and, you know, of course, uh, some of the uh, frustration also around uh, the, the seaports, bringing in goods, etc. The point that was made, especially about um, two people sitting around and um, questioning you and passing one passport, your passport from one person to the other, is one that I'm sure most of us uh, are, you know, just generally quite um, irritated about. But what, what, what it is is that we require what is called the eye check, which, which, is a, uh, which is a fairly elaborate device, which enables us to get advanced passenger information ahead of passengers actually arriving at the ports. Now, this will enable us to do two things. One, it enables us to give uh, visas on arrival because you have all the information. And secondly, it removes the necessity of more than one person checking the passports because you already have the advance information. So the security people don't need to sit down there also and check the information at the same time. So they work from the back end. We expect that when that is installed, we'll be able to achieve uh, that and uh, remove the nuisance of uh, two people or three people. Uh, just about, I think it was last week, we held a meeting with all, the, um, with all of the agencies that are usually at the ports. And you find, of course, that there are several you know, sometimes you find up to 14 uh, different agencies at the ports. So the whole idea is to reduce this number such that only those who must absolutely be there are there. For example, we said, you know, uh, NDLEA, you know, SON, there are so many that are there that really do not have, absolutely have to be there, you know, and they only need to be summoned when 
uh, their services are required. So we're looking at uh, how to do this. The, um, one, the, I think the permanent solution that we are proposing, especially for uh, the, the whole, you know, bringing in goods and taking goods out and all of that of our ports is our single window, the national trading platform. We've gone very far with, with that, and uh, we expect that that should be on stream very shortly. Of course, that will come with the scanners and the, you know, the whole works, and we expect that that should come on stream very shortly. We are uh, at the point where this is going to affect for a final approval, and we expect that that uh, should should happen very very shortly. With a single window, a lot, uh, a lot of the stress will be will be greatly reduced, and of course, with the appropriate scanners run uh, again with. Uh, by concessions uh, uh, with the, with the uh, PPP arrangement, with concessions a lot of these uh, facilities to the private sector so that they can, uh, they can uh, so that the service is much more efficient. I think we should be able to achieve uh, greater ease of um, uh, coming into our ports, bringing in goods to our ports and exporting uh, from our ports or taking goods out of our ports. So let me uh, join uh, my cabinet colleagues in, in again thanking you for making the time yet again to attend the quarterly business forum. Uh, this is the seventh forum, and there are many here who have attended all seven. Uh, to them, of course, we are uh, especially indebted for their consistent faith and support uh, for this process. But even those who have not attended seven have attended uh, several, and some who are attending for the first time. But we think that it is important that we continue to emphasize that for us, both philosophically and as a practical matter, our partnership with the private sector is fundamental. Aside from the quarterly business forum, we have also established other platforms to harness, uh, the, to harness this partnership. And these platforms include, as you know, the Industrial Policy and Competitiveness Advisory Council and the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, or rather long names, but you know, by and large, uh, these are interactive platforms where we bring the private sector to collaborate with us, to think through policy with us, develop policy with us, and in the uh, competitiveness council to even implement uh, policy with us. And I think that this is the way that um, we ought to continue and this is the way that we, we have to continue because uh, when you consider the, the size of, our, of, of the federal government's budget, even when you total, as the Minister of Finance has said, when you total or aggregate uh, the state government budgets, you still find that uh, the uh, absolute amounts are very small indeed, but once you factor in the public, the private sector, th that uh, becomes uh, uh, the, the real economy of Nigeria. And really, there's absolutely no way of um, going ahead and talking about economic development of a country this size without the private sector sitting right there at the table and playing a critical role. But uh, I, I've asked uh, the question, and I'll ask again, what was wrong with the Nigerian economy? And what did we need to do to correct the flaws? There are several issues, many of which have been already been very well articulated, and we articulate them time and time again, especially in all the earlier presentations. But I want to talk about what I think is probably the biggest problem, uh, but which we, for some reason, hardly talk about when discussing our national economy. Uh, this is grand corruption in the public finance space. I think that um, sometimes we, the, the way we talk about the Nigerian economy, it, it almost appears as if it is, you know, a very, it is the economy of, say, Norway or, you know, Sweden or somewhere, where all things are equal, you know. And even when we refer to what has taken place in our economy, we almost sound as if this is the economy, this is, in every sense, a very normal uh, business environment, a normal uh, public finance environment, but that's not the case. And I do not think that any, any considerations of our economic development can be properly or honestly done without fully analyzing the role of, of, of corruption, especially grand corruption in the public finance space. And we, you'll see that, you know, 
despite record high levels of oil uh, prices, very little was invested in infrastructure and record levels of le leakages were recorded, especially in the past few years. This is the fundamental issue in our economy. Corruption affects everything. It affects even judgment as to what sort of infrastructure to put in place, or whether to even put in place infrastructure, or whether infrastructure will ever be completed. It is, it is so fundamental that we cannot even think of our economy without thinking of what to do about it. And it's not just, uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about the economy, we say, okay, we've relied on a single commodity. And that's one of the reasons why we're where we are. But yes, that, that's true. It's a fact, but the fact is that proceeds of that single commodity were regularly hijacked consistently by a few. That is really the problem. If we spend the proceeds of that single commodity the way we ought to spend it, we won't be where we are today. The truth is that it was hijacked consistently by a few people. That most of the proceeds go to rent seekers who invest little in industry and production. So for example, in a so-called, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the so-called strategic alliance contracts with the NMPC and the uh, NDPC. The promoters of the companies made away with close to three billion US dollars, almost a tenth of our reserves at one point. Now, if there's no way in the world that if somebody makes a way with almost a tenth of your reserves, that you're not going to have a major economic shock. And if we don't if we don't deal with it, if we don't talk about it, how do we really discuss our economy in any real honest way with a view to ensuring that these things do not happen again? In one single transaction, a few weeks to uh, the elections in 2015, sums of 100 billion and 289 million dollars were just, you know, frittered, embezzled by a few. When you consider that in 2014, as the Minister of Finance said, all prices were at an average of $110 a barrel, and only 99 billion naira was spent on power works and housing. Only 99 billion. And in one day, 100 billion naira was, was issued. And people essentially shared it. And 99 billion was spent on power works and housing. And when we talk about our economy, we talk about it as if it is the normal, it's not as a, that's abnormal by every standard, completely abnormal. Nobody, nobody should, nobody should talk about uh, the economy when you have these kinds of huge, huge leakages, huge corruption, corruption that completely makes even what you are allocating to capital, what you are allocating to infrastructure, just makes nonsense of it. Because when you compare, I mean, we saw from the presentation of the Minister of Finance, 14 billion spent on agriculture in 2014, 14 billion. Transportation, 15 billion. So the total spent on capital in those critical areas was 153 billion. And in two weeks before the uh, 2015 elections, 150 billion was released and essentially shared. So if your total infrastructure spent, your total capital spent, is 150, and you, and you can share 153 billion. I mean, let's, let, let, let's face it, that is, a, that is completely incredible. It's the sort of thing that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And when we are talking about, uh, and when we talk about the economy, we absolutely must understand that that is the problem. Today, with less revenue, we have increased funding, uh, capital funding, by 400%, as the minister uh, pointed out in public, uh, in power works and housing, in defense, in transportation, in agriculture. So economic analysis in Nigeria is either fraudulent or ignorant if we do not bring the money lost to corruption into the mass. We absolutely must bring it into the mass. It is a fight against corruption, especially in public finance. And I can say what, that what I have seen is that if you have a precedent, and, and, and I say this with all sense of responsibility, if you have a precedent in this country who is not corrupt, 50% of your financial problems, especially in the public financial space, are over. 50% at least is over. And this is what I have seen. I can demonstrate this with facts. I can demonstrate this with figures. If the president is corrupt, 
the, the entire financial system of the country is compromised. And that's what we've seen. It's completely compromised from the figures that we've just seen. It's completely compromised. That is an absolutely important point that we must, that, that we must take into account. I'm not saying that corruption under this administration has been completely dealt with, no. I mean, certainly not. Where corruption has become systematic, such as we have in our country today, you can't deal with it in one fell swoop. It's not possible. In any event, you still have a lot of corruption fighting back. The system fights back, and it's both an internal and external fight back. And you have to be steadfast and strategic to win the battle. There is no way that you have a system such as ours that has consistently thrived on corruption and proceeds of corruption, and public finance in particular, that will give up and just roll over and say, hey, guys, the problem has been solved. No. It's a system that has fed on corruption. It's a system that has actively, actively dwelt on corruption. And it's a system that affects all aspects of governance. So it's not, it's not a, it's so clearly, trying to deal with it is, is, is not, uh, is certainly not uh, a, a, a walk in the park, as they say. But I want to say that that task has already begun. We, uh, and that task is being done consistently. And I believe that going forward, I believe that going forward in the next few years, even no matter how uh, we, we slice it, if we stick to policy, especially on controlling excesses and corruption in public finance, this country will make the kind of progress that it deserves to make with all of the resources at our disposal. If we stick to a policy of ensuring that at least as far as public finance is concerned, there is no impunity and that we hold people to account, I'm absolutely confident that this country has everything that it takes to really make the kind of progress uh, that we deserve to make uh, as a nation. So again, let me just thank everyone for uh, the, your participation and for your continued support and confidence in uh, the work that we're doing. And I want to say that all of the comments you've made, all of the issues that you have raised, we take them seriously and we will go back and look at what uh, we need to do to ensure that um, we, uh, to ensure that uh, all of our objectives, all of our plans and thoughts come to fruition and that our country becomes a much better place for doing business and that the economy of our country grows to the benefit of our people. So I want to thank you again very much. God bless you.